And can somebody um, pull the back doors shut? Because the noise from the hallway really is very annoying. We're almost ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone back. I'm Caroline Wagner, the director of the Battelle Center for Science and Technology Policy here at uh, The Ohio State University. I'm very glad to um, be able to begin our uh, Friday morning panel on the economic impacts of big data. Um, and uh, as we've mentioned, the bios for the speakers are in the booklet, um, just take my word for it, they're all rock stars and doing amazing things. Um, first up is um, Johan Bolin. Uh, Johan is currently uh, Associate Professor at Indiana University School of Informatics and Computing. He was formerly a staff scientist at Los Alamos um, National Lab 2005 to 2009. And um, he has a PhD um, in uh, experimental psychology. And um, I'm not going to say it in, in um, Dutch, but from the Free, you know, yeah. the free uh, University of Brussels. Yeah, yes. it's not free, though. But <laughs> <laughs> it's called free. <laughs> uh, the Vrij Universiteit. All right. So um, anyway, uh, I still remember the first presentation I ever saw Johan give. And um, it was at a conference. Um, you were still at Sandia, and uh, I remember that all myself and most of the other senior scientometric people who do science mapping and so on just sat there with their mouths hanging <laughs> open at how amazing you are. <laughs> um, your work is fantastic. Um, so he's going to talk for 15 minutes. Then we'll uh, have Angela Byers. Angela is the Director of Product Planning and Strategy in Apps Media Publishing um, at Microsoft, and um, she's within the Apps and Services product group, and she leads long-term strategic scenario planning uh, for Microsoft Network and Bing Apps. So, um, and the rest of her bio is there. Welcome. So glad you're here. And then um, third, we have Ray Harishankar. Um, Ray, he just got back from California, right? I can't believe Sorry. all these people are traveling all over the place. <laughs> Uh, Johan's on his way to London, and um, he's, uh, Ray is an IBM fellow and vice president of technology and innovation within IBM Global Business Services, and um, is recently involved with um, a, a big uh, undertaking here in the Columbus region, where IBM has made quite a significant investment and is working on a collaboratory with a number of other companies. Hopefully, he'll talk a little bit about that in his talk as well, or maybe we can ask you about it at, sure, at the end. Yeah, we'd we'll be interested in talking about it. Okay, well, it would follow the same format. Um, <coughs> each person has 15 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A, um, hopefully a lively discussion as we've been having. Uh, I continue to tweet at hashtag Big Data Future. Uh, if you can't follow right now, you could always go back later and search for that hashtag because I know some other people are also... Um, tweeting on that hashtag, so you can go back and kind of review what's been happening at the at the conference. All right, with that, we'll say good morning to Johan and take it away. 15 okay, minutes. great. Um, I am known to uh, rant really badly, so and, and I, but in this case, I've been told to stick to 15 minutes or else, <laughs> and uh, I think the, I, I don't want to experience the or else. I mean, threats have been made. Serious threat, so I'm going to stick to 15 minutes. I'm going to try to. Okay, here we go. So big data and computational social science. I don't know how many of you have seen this Dilbert cartoon, which I thought was just hilarious. Uh, consultants say three quintillion bytes of data created every day. It comes from everywhere. It knows all. According to the book of Wikipedia, it's, its name is Big Data. Anyways, we've got the cult of big data uh, forming in the uh, corporate headquarters of the world, right? And it, it, the, the, the cartoon ends with uh, uh, a genuflection, let us pay. You know, is it too late to side with evil? It hears you. I thought it was really funny. Uh, you know, honestly, I mean, preparing for this talk, the, 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 the challenge I had is that I don't think about big data very much. You know, it's, 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 you know it, it, it sounds really pretentious, but big data to me is like water to a fish. It's, it's, it's what we do. So, you know, I, we never sit back and, and, and hardly ever sit back and go, wow, that data is big. It's bigger than last year. 
It's always bigger than last year, and whatever data we had last year is now small compared to what we had this year. So to call it big data to me is, is a little bit of a misnomer because it, it's always been big data somehow. Um, so I, I think that's what this, the, this cartoon is really trying to tell us, you know, that, that by giving it a name like big data, it, it, it's like it's a thing, right? It's like the cloud, and it lives somewhere, and it hovers over us, and it's looking down, and uh, that's not how it feels to me at all. Now, I will say, though, I've thought a lot about the role of data in my um, sort of practice as a scientist, and again, all of this sounds really highfalutin and pretentious, and I, I, I don't want it to, because it's, it's just the, you know, the, the, the basic sort of uh, uh, basic drudgery of science, if you can call it that, right? Um, my, my education is in the social sciences. I, my PhD is actually in, in experimental psychology, where you put rats in mazes and then, you know, see how you can uh, achieve various outcomes under different experimental conditions. And so I found this Venn diagram online, and I thought it was very revealing. It's from a Given the Data blog, where they were trying to sort of summarize what it means to do data-driven computational social science, which is what I think we do at Indiana University. So you've got the social sciences, right? Uh, the typical methodology by which the social sciences operate is that you set up an experiment. Uh, um, uh, you design an experiment to test a particular, or rather to, to falsify a particular hypotheses, right? And you subject mostly grad students to a variety of experimental conditions, and then you observe the outcomes, and you determine whether they the outcomes match the, the theory or the hypotheses, and if they don't, then you adjust the hypotheses or the, the theory. That's kind of how it works. So those are the quantitative methods that people talk about, which is sort of the, the, the framework of traditional empirical research. But at least in my experience, uh, for most of my colleagues, that paradigm has really been uh, altered in, in a fundamental manner, and I think a lot of people aren't really aware of the, of the, the radical paradigm shift that that represents. You know, um, it, once you start combining uh, the social sciences with quantitative methods and computer science, you immediately converge on where the data is at, where the big data is at, right? And and so you end up with something called that Lazare in, uh, in science called uh, data-driven computational social sciences, where you use computational methods like computers, supercomputing, etc., to analyze um, uh, large-scale data that you've obtained with respect to uh, a variety of psychological or behavioral uh, phenomena and then analyze them with the purpose of testing, uh, a testing hypothesis or theory in the social sciences. Right? The, I, I sometimes joke with my colleagues that the data now is so big that basically the, the, the whole of the data that we collect is some, 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 some experiment generating machine, and all we need to do is just slice and dice the data to find the experimental conditions that have been set up for us in vivo, and then look at the outcomes, right? and study the outcomes, instead of actually conducting the experiment ourselves, it's actually already been conducted somewhere, somewhere by someone. I mean, people go on Twitter, for example, and said, I just had two shots of whiskey and a Valium, and now I don't feel so good. Well, there you have it. That's a, that's a medical experiment right there. So, and, and we laugh, but people have actually been using social media data uh, to look at drug interactions, et cetera, which, which I think is absolutely fantastic research. But again, for me, science is about the methodology. As a psychologist, this, this was hammered into us, you know, never be ashamed to be a psychologist, you're a scientist just as well because you adhere to the scientific method, right? And what big data is actually uh, represents is a, is a paradigm shift in how we conduct science in that actual process, and that's why it matters uh, to us. That's where the, the importance really is. Now, a lot of people, and this is something I, I, I have noticed in this discussion quite a bit, and this data is already dated by a year, which means it's off by 40%. That's kind of, sort of the, the amazing thing that's happening right in front of our eyes. If you look at uh, Facebook, now has 1.3 billion user accounts. I don't know how many of these are actually people, how many of these are bots or, or figments of our imagination, but 1.3 billion user accounts, that's about one-sixth of humanity. There's only, only 7 billion people on Earth. Right? If you look at Twitter, for example, 500 million people posting about one tweet a day. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of data. That means that we've got great coverage worldwide and especially in the West and developed countries. Right? Um, uh, so what's special about that data other than being big? To, to a computational social science, I'm not interested in big data just because it's big. I think that's really lame. Uh, you know, I, I, as I said, you know, the big data of today will be minuscule in, in a year. So that can be what, what we're interested in. Um, I think I think there's two things here. For, the first one is the the nature of the data. Ten minutes. Oh God. Okay. This is the nature of the data. So 
if you look at, the, you know, I, 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 sometimes I'm really surprised at the kind of stuff that people share on Twitter. Some of it is really practical, like uh, uh, Fredo Dupu, for example, right here is reporting that, that he's seen dead bodies everywhere. This is after the, uh, the Haiti disaster, right, where a lot of the humanitarian response, I think, was actually uh, modulated by social media. And it really shows that once you connect people, even across great distances, they develop empathy for each other. And so I'm really hopeful about humanity overall, just because we're being drawn uh, closer and closer closer. You know, people use it for corporate announcements. You know, the Ukraine, for example, has a lot of twittering and tweeting going on. But sometimes really pedestrian stuff like li laying in bed on spring break with a headache, stomach, and chills, right? Someone's not very happy, and you can actually tell from the tweet or someone here saying depressed and lost in this world, uh, someone getting fired, which, which might have economic uh, uh, importance, right? So the content is fantastic. I mean, the, the, the granularity of this data is so, so fine. You know, I mean, people are reporting on what they ate you know, when they ate it, whether they liked it, whether the, 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 the gravy should have been more salty, you know, the, 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 just about e every component of people's daily lives are being posted in these environments, which for a behavioral scientist or um, a social scientist is, is tremendously interesting. But in addition to that, we don't just have the data, we have the relationships between these individuals and the relationships between these data explicitly represented in a, in a machine readable format. So it's not just about someone saying, you know, man, uh, uh, life not fair, got fired for that, right? You actually can, you, uh, we're actually capable of determining whether that, uh, that negativity is actually spreading out to the people that this particular individual is connected to, which allows us to do really interesting things at the level of uh, mood, sentiment and how it propagates through these social networks. And that's what I'm really interested in. You know, I think a lot of people look at uh, a lot of economic modeling and a lot of um, uh, cognitive modeling is based on sort of the idea of bounded rationality of us being sort of uh, making rational, relatively rational uh, decisions based on input and information that we receive from our environment. But I think that overall, a lot of opinion, a lot of sentiment is just a post hoc rationalization of what we've already done or thought. Right, and it has very little to do with, with with the actual intent. So what I'm interested in is studying how people un undergo sort of a variation of mood states, and whether they do that collectively or not, and when it shapes very large scale sort of societal level uh, uh, social economic uh, phenomena. I mean, most of us are very mu well aware of the fact that everybody, uh, that all of us are, are sort of na naturally endowed to experience a variety of, of emotions and mood states are very recognizable. You show these kind of pictures to just about anyone in the world and they'll be able to just pick up on disgust, uh, happiness, elation, worry, uh, et cetera. It's, a, it's a near, it's a nearly wired, in, well, it's, it is wired into the brain. But the question is, do we as a group, as a, for example, if I look at your faces right now, I can tell that boredom is sort of the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> the collective mood state of this room. But the, but the question is, is that, is, is that a thing? Is it something, is, is it something that, that has its own sort of epistemological, uh, uh, realities, well, no, that's not the right expression, but I I is it more than just the aggregate of the individual mood states of all of the individuals, right? If you sum it up and average it out, is that, is, is that you know, is it, is it more than that? I mean, clearly, groups of people can run amok, right? Mood and sentiment can be contagious. For example, in this photo, I always make a joke that this is, I think this is, a, this looks like a town hall meeting where people are getting very upset about the prospect of receiving free health care. Um, <laughs> only in America can, <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> you provide us discounts on private health insurance. We 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 riot. Okay. Uh, now people have been very interested. Uh, well, five minutes. Okay. People have been very interested. Only five minutes. See, this is what happens. People have been very interested in measuring sort of uh, uh, subjective well-being and how people in general, in particular countries in the world, feel and how happy they are. Right. And generally, how that's done is you just essentially make phone calls. And you call people and just, just tell them on a scale from one to ten, how happy are you these days, right? And they'll tell you. And it's actually pretty reliable. You can ask them a hundred questions. You do a principal component analysis. Overall, it kind of maps into people saying one to ten, this is how happy I am. And you can see that, for example, Americans are pretty happy. The French are a little more dour. <laughs> That's one of my favorite <laughs> examples. And then the, the, this little dot here is my home country of Belgium and Holland. And uh, the, the pretty happy bunch as well, in spite of the weather. Um, so. But the problem with that is that you actually have to ask people how they feel. So you, you're dealing with social conformity bias. It's really expensive to conduct these surveys. You only get what you're asking for from the surveys, unexpected 
uh, results are really difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, unexpected phenomena difficult to gauge. Uh, but nowadays, as I said, we have all of the social media data that allows us to analyze this kind of data in real time. It's real time information, so we can do what we call now casting. We measure reality sort of the present time so close, you know, right down to the bone, if you can call it that, right, that it nearly looks like we're predicting things, except that we're not. It's like Google, for example, with their flu predicting, they're not predicting the flu, they're measuring actual flu rates as they occur in real time because they have the uh, uh, query volume. Uh, box office receipts, people talk a lot about a movie, it's likely they're going to see that movie. There's a variety of things that you can actually uh, measure from the <coughs> social network. So very quickly, I think I've got four minutes to tell you how to predict the stock market, which is probably why you all showed up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that people have been doing this is that, for example, you've got a bunch of tweets, right? And, and a human can very easily read these and say, well, I think my headphones are electrocuting me. That's not a happy tweet. Most of us will immediately realize that my mom almost killed me this morning. I don't know how much longer I can take. That's a really sad tweet. Everybody can see that. Uh, my beautiful friend, I love your sweet smile, your amazing soul. That's probably a happy tweet. Um, computers are not as bad at analyzing sentiment as you would think, especially relative to people. When people read text, we all get confused. Everybody's written response to an email that they misinterpreted emotionally. And uh, th these kind of algorithms are getting pretty good, at least achieving, converging on, on human performance. There's a whole bunch of libraries right off the shelf, won't go into the particular techniques. Okay, here's what we did. Okay, so you take a bunch of Twitter feeds, you pass them through what is now a proprietary text analysis algorithm. I, I cannot tell you the details about it because the university would uh, sue me. Uh, you, can, you have a patent on and that we patent it, yes. Yeah. And so you've got a bunch of mood indicators, and the, the unique thing is that it doesn't analyze positive or negative. It's, just, it's not telling you someone drank a, a cup of Coke and they liked it, so that's positive. They didn't like it, that's negative. It actually decomposes uh, human mood into uh, six distinct mood dimensions, calm, alert, sure, vital, kind, and happy, which have been shown to be good sort of uh, uh, antecedents of actual behavior, right? Uh, it's, it's built from internet language, so it's, I've got one more minute. Uh, and uh, based on advanced, uh, advances in uh, natural language processing, we, we patented it, but we didn't just patent the, 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 the actual algorithm, but also the technique of, of predicting economic uh, trends from this kind of data. So here's an example. I'm so not bored, way too busy, feel really great. And it gives you six ratings of that tweet along these, these six distinct uh, mood dimensions. If you aggregate this on a second-to-second -second or a day-to-day -day basis, what you end up is something like this. You get to these squiggly lines. They, this is, by the way, the, uh, the election of President Obama in 2008, which led to a lot of anxiety the day before the election. I was very anxious myself, I can tell you. Also very energetic, you know, people on the street going, yeah, we can, we can, it's gonna happen. Um, and, and here's Thanksgiving, which makes people feel good. Okay, so pretty straightforward stuff. Now, what we got interested in, and this is, of course, 2008 when I lost 50% of my retirement savings and it means that I'm working out every single day to stay healthy <laughs> until the age of 90 so I can continue to work off what we've lost in the stock market. Um, anyway, so I figured that was going to make people very unhappy. So I told my student, because we weren't getting this stuff published, by the way. i got to stop. Okay. And I told, minutes, can minutes. I get two minutes to tell minutes, you about go. the stock market prediction? Okay, here yeah, we go. Right. Okay, so, uh, good. so anyway. Move along, move along. So I told my student, listen, we can't get this published because the reader is coming back saying, well, you've got a bu bunch of squiggly lines. You can't, you can't prove it means anything. Besides, Twitter is just about, you know, people tweeting about Justin Bieber's latest album. So forget about it. So you've seen that, that YouTube clip about Hitler complaining about the third reviewer? Yeah? It's hilarious. That is what happened in the hallway of our department when I heard that our third paper got rejected. So I told my student, listen, get, just get the Dow Jones on it. Just get the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and correlate to our time series. See whether we can validate it to something economical. I won't go into the methodology, but what we did is we, we performed two tests, the Granger causality analysis, which is somewhat of a sort of a linear regression technique where you shift one of the time series back and forward and you see at which point you achieve a, a, a statistically significant correlation. And then we trained the neural network, blah, 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 blah. Anyway. Well, Thank you. So, <laughs> what we so this is what they warned me about. So, what we found is that the especially the calm time series, when you superimpose it on the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, uh, daily changes, uh, demonstrated a remarkable amount of overlap. So, this is when you shift this forward in time by three days, you can see how the highs and lows nearly match perfectly. And in fact, when we trained our neural network based on both three day uh, past three day market data and our calm mood dimension, we achieved an, a, a prediction accuracy of 86.7% in terms of the, predicting the direction of the stock market on a day to day basis. Now, 
th this makes me sound like a crackpot. Nobody believes that you can predict the stock market at 86.7%. However, you know, we've, wow. we've done follow-up studies, and this result has actually held up really nice, I'm not saying 86.7%, but very high percentages. Uh, a, a huge hedge fund actually tested this, and they found that they, they, they had a return in life training of about 30% over the course of, uh, of a year. So that's, that, that's inspired, that, that inspired the university to, to uh, patent the technology, license it to my startup. That's GuideWave Consulting right now, and we're generating these signals and selling them to, to hedge funds and uh, potentially government. Do you want to make an investment? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. So we're not giving investment advice. We're just providing a signal that, that just happens to be highly uh, uh, predictive and very informative to people who put their money in the market and, and, and like to get an edge. And even a small edge could be uh, very valuable. Now, if you want to read up on what we have done in terms of sort of unraveling what we think is sort of the causal pathways that could explain these results, there's a bunch of papers online. They're all available uh, open access in our archive. I recommend you to read them and get in touch with me if you have any uh, further questions. The only thing I will say is I, I'm really stoked about the, the future of competition social science. The data sets keep getting more and more refined more and more representative, and, I, and my hope is that we'll, we'll arrive at a point in time when we can still do well thought out controlled experiments like people used to do and still do in social sciences, but that's augmented by pretty reliable and valid uh, big data uh, uh, computational social science um, experiments, if you can call it that. I'm sorry I went over time. All right, I, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Is there a consumer offering we can get in on? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. that's what we're hoping well, for. coming soon. Yeah, right? the, the yeah. Start, what we're, we're doing is we're... We came to here. Yeah, the, the idea is not to just focus on uh, big hedge funds, but also to have a um, something for retail investors. Oh, so we'll nice. probably be publishing a weather report for the markets yeah. in different segments uh, uh, quite soon. Yeah. And, um, you know, hopefully that will awesome. allow our subscribers to make a little extra money. All right, now we'll welcome Angela. Hi, thank you for having me here today. Um, what I want to share is actually comes from both the perspective of uh, having been an economist myself. My prior life before Microsoft was um, I worked as a research fellow at the McKinsey Global Institute um, studying the economic, of impa economic impact of big data. Um, so what I'm going to share combines the perspective from that as well as the perspective now as a business manager at Microsoft trying to use big data insights, right, to improve the way we run our business. Um, so what I'm going to share is uh, first just how big data creates value and um, the potential that there is across different sectors, um, both in terms of traditional dollar measures but also in terms of consumer surplus. Um, along that theme, I want to talk a little bit about the disruptive power of big data, how that's changing business. Um, and I want to take the last part of it to address a little bit of uh, kind of the, the elephant in the room that we read a lot of um, commentaries on, you know, is big data a big hype? You know, where is the impact? Um, so I want to share just a few thoughts on that and, you know, what I think um, it might take to make that happen. Um, oh, actually, I'll just stay there for a minute. Um, so with that said, a, a few years ago, uh, we started to study the economic impact of big data um, at the McKinsey Global Institute, and what we found was that this was really a broad-based phenomenon, not limited to just a few industries, that, you know, as uh, my colleagues have been saying, you know, there's big data, there's data, big data everywhere. Um, and what we found when we did case studies was across the sectors, there are a few common ways that um, companies can use big data to create value. The first is simply using big data to create transparency, which exposes variability that drives better performance. Um, a very common and perhaps mundane example is scorecards, right? Um, at every company you have, you have scorecards of different business units. It bubbles up from large, large amounts of data to a few key metrics. Um, but from that, you can really see who's performing and who's underperforming, and that just often sparks a discussion of pulling up the underperformers up to the benchmark. Um, another example, you know, in healthcare, for example, um, the transparency into clinical outcomes data, um, the benefits tool that I now use, I can see uh, which doctors is providing which types of services, at what price, and what's the quality, at least, is rated by um, patients. Um, all those different types of tools is trying to induce more value-conscious consumption. A second lever is about using big data to enable experimentation. Um, and that often involves a lot of rigorous statistical analyses to figure out which way is the best to do things. 
Um, I work in the online media world, uh, MSN and, and Bing apps, and so A-B testing is a really common practice um, to figure out how best to design a site or an app, um, or in the case of e-commerce, right, you really want to try to figure out how to design your checkout process um, to reduce your abandonment rate. Um, again, another example in healthcare, um, you know, we now can study uh, crunch large, large sets of data to do comparative effectiveness studies, and you really figure out which treatment works best for whom and under what circumstances. A third way of using big data to create value is um, segmenting the populations to customize actions. Um, now, this is really common practice in marketing and in financial services for a long time. You know, you study your consumers and you target your offers. Um, but even in that space, I think there continues to be more innovation in terms of technologies getting more powerful to do this in more real time, like the now casting we just talked about, um, and do it at finer and finer granularity. Um, and I think that, uh, and another example, um, you know, we hear that uh, insurance companies now can take, say, um, predictive uh, weather data, uh, combine that with where you live, the census data and, and claims data, and they can figure out, you know, who in what neighborhood may actually have the highest likelihood of uh, getting into a hail storm, and therefore they can target the offers specifically for hail damage. Um, and in other sectors, I think this is actually can be a pretty revolutionary idea. Um, take public sector, for example. Um, we had uh, we, we study a, a German uh, a federal labor agency, which actually, uh, depending on the type of unemployed workers you are, they actually tailor the programs for you. Um, so just the fact of being able to tailor that can actually maybe make more efficient use of limited resources in public sector. Um, a fourth one is replacing um, and supporting uh, human decision making with uh, automated algorithms. Um, so, you know, analytics can help companies improve decisions, everything from upstream, from um, uh, where to invest, capital, um, asset optimization, to supply chain, to, um, um, to customer service, to sales. Um, and now in the era of Internet of Things, when physical assets and machines and equipment, they're embedded with networked sensors and actuators, that's opening an entirely new field um, of possibilities of how machines can just talk to each other and they can act independently based on um, information. Um, and lastly, innovation. Um, big data really has the power to create and innovate the way we do businesses. Um, location data, for example, and mapping data, that's, you know, single-handedly created a whole entire offerings, everything from, um, you know, Foursquare um, and whatnot, uh, and, and mapping and real-time traffic information, um, and financial services, right? Credit card companies can take the anonymized spending data that you have um, and analyze it and actually package it up for merchants to study spending patterns um, or for more real-time macroeconomic trends. So all of this I talked about, I think, actually bubbles up to some pretty big numbers, potentially, in value across sectors. Um, I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but I'll just rattle off a few big numbers um, in the sense that this, the title of this talk is the economic <laughs> impact of big data. Um, so for example, in U.S. retail, um, it's estimated that 30 to $55 billion of value of savings can be created annually through applying big data in merchandising, in operations, in sales. Um, and actually hundreds and billions of dollars more in potential value shifts. So some companies might gain on the expense of another company. Mm -hmm. um, in consumer packaged goods, for example, open data, we think that there is potentially an, uh, the potential to do uh, half a trillion to one and a half trillion dollars in value. Again, applying it everything from product design to manufacturing to logistics um, all the way downstream. And that also includes um, the consumer benefits of being able to compare prices and quality um, and attributes in those decisions. Um, in manufacturing, for example, in the U.S., again, we think that there's potentially 125 to $270 billion of value, um, applying it on R&D, the manufacturing, um, and the after-sales um, service cycles. Um, electricity, um, you know, not a very uh, uh, consumer-facing example, but nonetheless, when you start digging into the potential to improve investment decisions, to optimize generation, um, the distribution, and all the way to influencing um, consumers to use more energy conscious products. Um, again, we think that that can be almost up to half a trillion dollars in value in that. 
Um, so, you know, there's plenty of more examples I can go into, um, but, you know, I think the point is that there can be some pretty big dollars here, um, potential. Um, there's two points in the theme of um, economic impact I want to just spend a minute on. Um, one is uh, we talked about innovation and the disruptive power of it. Um, and I think just for my own personal example, having lived in the online media space, um, it's a, I think it's a very powerful way that big data is uh, creating change. Um, of course, there have been the decades long, you know, digital media and digital distribution disrupting um, the physical media and the traditional distributions. Um, but I think a, a maybe a, a more recent and maybe less talked about example, um, again, similar to what we just heard about, that all the different types of signals that we have now is really changing the way um, online media and on online news can work, right? Um, we know so much about what people read, um, what they say they want to follow, um, what are the social signals, what articles they liked, what they're sharing with their friends, um, and what's trending on the overall cyber uh, social cyberspace um, and where they are. And all of those signals, we can now have the power to you know, use that to really serve up personalized, relevant content, still with a dose of serendipity, because people still really want the element of surprise. Um, and that's what you know, we, for decades and decades, have human editors do. So it's really interesting what signals uh, combining all these signals can do now. Um, you know, you see that being used in a lot of the reader apps and sites and Prismatic, um, and that's really putting the pressure for traditional uh, online media companies to respond. Um, another theme I want to touch on uh, along the line of economic impact is consumer surplus, because I don't think that gets captured a lot in traditional uh, macroeconomic statistics. Um, so if you take the area of um, personal location data, right, knowing where I am and all the mapping data and traffic information out there. Um, it helps me get to somewhere in the fastest possible way in avoiding traffic. And, and that, we estimate it could be up to, you know, half a trillion dollars in value in savings and time and fuel. And that vastly dwarfs the, you know, about $100 billion of re revenue we estimated that location-based uh, service providers uh, can actually earn. Um, and take another example, I think we all experience this, right? Like the Yelp app on my phone that um, helps me find where um, to eat last night. Um, you know, that creates value that's not really captured anywhere. Um, so all of that that I talked about, you know, really translates directly into um, um, uh, productivity <laughs> measures and whatnot. Um, it really allows the economy to produce the same level of output with the same, same level of output with a reduced level of input. Um, and I think over time, we're gonna see um, a lot of this value starting to accrue. Now, the big elephant in the room is I think we've all read a lot in the um, block space about, well, so we've talked a whole lot about big data. There's some big numbers out there. So where is it showing up? Um, it is fair, I asked myself that too, because we did, we started analyzing this a few years ago now, um, and I wonder, okay, where, where is it gonna show up? When is it? Um, for, for me, I do believe that it is something that's gonna take time. Um, the impact of big data starts um, at the individual company level um, when companies start embracing the techniques. Um, and over time, as competition adopts it, then it's gonna start accumulate um, to the order of uh, impact that of some of those big numbers that just show on the previous slides. Um, and I really think that by all indicators, we're still kind of at the early days of it. Um, if you read uh, a lot of the IDC, Gartner type reports, you know, they, pre they still put this at, you know, the beginning of the hype cycle that's gonna take another five, 10 years to reach the plateau of productivity. <laughs> um, so there's just a lot more technology investment um, that still needs to happen. Um, uh, in order for us to get there. Um, but you know, that's not alone. Um, when we study this, I think another big barrier is um, the talent shortage. Mm -hmm. We predicted there is about 1.8 million people short um, in realizing this impact. And that's everything from software engineers that need to code this, um, to rock star statisticians that know how to analyze this data and can produce the right algorithms, um, to actually people like myself, you know, business managers that need to at least have some understanding of statistics so I can take the insights from big data and actually say, well, now I know I need to do ABC differently. Um, and so, uh, you know, universities starting to have interdisciplinary programs, so I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, gonna help. Um, I think a bigger issue is probably for those of us already in the workforce, you know, how do you get those people comfortable with a different way of decision making? Um, 
I, and I think that goes along with the line uh, 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 with the organizational change and talent um, issues. Um, you know, it really needs, uh, there needs to be a lot of thinking in how to uh, combine data and tools and um, frontline resources and people and how you incentivize people to start creating change. Um, then data and policies, obviously, I think we've discussed this at length at this conference, so I won't go into that. Um, I, I think where I want to end is that I think the organizational change and um, issue is super important. You know, I see that um, even in the companies like Microsoft around me, it, it, it takes a lot to change the way people make decisions. Um, and at MGI, when we studied the um, economic impact of IT back in the 90s, its contribution to the productivity growth, what we learned was that the key driver was not so much about the dollars that was invested in IT, because there were sectors that spent a lot of money in IT, they actually saw declines in productivity. Um, what actually was a key driver was changing um, the management practices um, that goes along with the investment of IT. Um, and there are academic studies that are starting to show that, that companies that use big data and insights to make decisions, um, they tend to have, it correlates with higher market value and they tend to be more productive. Um, I think at MIT, Bernofsen and their colleague, they've studied this and they found, you know, companies that do this, you know, tend to have about, I think, like five to six percent um, more product, higher productivity and a higher return on equity um, than, their, um, than their competitors. Um, so I'll just end with that. I think I'm um, an optimist having studied this um, and, and now kind of living and breathing through the space um, in terms of using it. Um, I think there's still a lot of technology investments, a lot of talent issues. Um, data policy issues and I think management issues that <coughs> just over time uh, will get worked out, but um, I'm optimistic that um, companies are going to start embracing it and we're going to start seeing big data move the needle um, in some of the big uh, macroeconomic metrics we watch. So, thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I agree about the time saved on the f using the uh, Right. Apps. It's yeah. fantastic. I was and, and I was thinking, well, that might be a road a road rage reducer. We could <laughs> <laughs> we could look for an, an indicator of road rage reduction. <laughs> um, That's another but benefit. on indicators, um, yeah. what would you look for in at, in the manufacturing sector? How would you see the the shift made by big data in in terms of actual impact? Is is that just going to be measured at the very That's biggest cool. level, or are people yeah. going to be able to measure it lower down? Do you think? Yeah, um, I think you, first you're probably going to start seeing the company level indicators okay. moving, right? Um, you know, if you compare manufacturers that pay, you know, use data well in their processes versus those that don't. Uh -huh. um, and I think that level of profitability, like over time, it's going to bubble up. Some of it will wash out, right? Like some companies gain at the expense of others. Yeah, I But see. overall, you hopefully would see a lift in efficiency I overall because everyone is starting to adopt this sort of practice, right. so uh -huh. you okay. get the same level of manufacturing output with uh -huh. less resources, and then you're going to see the GDP per capita growth um, okay. move. Cool. cool. Wonderful. Ray, welcome. Excellent. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good. I expected a much more feebler response, but <laughs> I, I see the caffeine working. All right. I usually don't have the sexy voice, but my, my throat's a little <laughs> on the downside. So it, it, it's very interesting to see Johan and, and Angela and then, and then me following, so I'm thinking, hmm, all the good points have been made. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously, I, you know, what I do with an IBM is, 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 is uh, let me provide that as context to what I'm about to say. I work about, 60-70% uh, of my time is spent it, with clients. So I deal with primarily clients in the financial services and, and retail industry. And, and work with them to see how technology and innovation can help them um, you know, make business advancements. And clearly big data in the last <coughs> couple of years has been one of the you know, focus areas. And, and as Johan said, you know, what is big data when you're in the right in the middle of it, right? It's all around you. Um, but the key is how do you take advantage of what's around you and, and realize that, hey, here's the context of what I'm working in, and therefore here's a set of innovative things that you could do with it. So m primarily what I'm going to talk about is from the standpoint of what do I see as customers or enterprises <coughs> deal with, and how can they realize 
the, the economic impact of, of big data, if you will. Okay, uh, there you go. So when we went and asked our customers the question, are you really capitalizing on big data? One in three of our you know, enterprises said, I'm making decisions, but I don't have all the information available. More than half of them said, I don't, even if I wanted to, I don't have access to all the information. Mm -hmm. So that's reality, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to operate within that. But then the point is, we turn around and say, if only you could make decisions based on big data, mm -hmm. what would the impact be? You'd be two and a half times more likely to outperform your partners in the industry. You'll be probably two times, you know, uh, <coughs> Uh, more profitable or two times more profit growth rather. You know, you, the statistics are there for you to see. But the point is, if you make decisions, business decisions based on data, right? So this is the ba baseline. Now, however, the question is, what was data before and manageable is now becoming more and more difficult. People don't even know data because even if it stares at them in their face, as they say it, because it's changed a lot. So a little bit of definition or context on what, what I would call as you know, uh, data and, and, and value from it. Data plus some analysis gives you information. Information plus context gives you the insight. Insight plus action is results in outcome. And it is these outcomes that help you realize value. Data by itself doesn't lead to value, right? You have to put context around it. And, and, you know, again, the Angela was talking about the location-based services, right? One important statistic or interesting statistic is that people say, "Whoa, I don't know if people, I can really turn on the GPS in my phone. I don't know if people want to know where I am. But trust me, statistics show that in 2013, more than twice the amount of people in 2012 allowed the GPS locator, locator-based services to be turned on. So people are becoming more and more you know, open to turning on location-based services. Now, certain things may be faster adopted than others, but the point is there is increasing adoption of, of the capabilities that let you take advantage of big data and provide services. So I know Angela touched on some of these points, so it's good to know that we are coming at it from multiple perspectives, but still sort of addressing the same. So, how do you create value out of you know, just big data, if you really think about it? What we see is new business models are emerging. Primarily data-driven products and services are rising to the top. And that, in the next five years or so, are going to be the new businesses that are coming up. And even within that, new business models are coming up. You touched on the agile experimentation, as well as you know, the, the, the formulation of non-traditional partnerships. People who are co you know, in, in competition now may find common grounds to co you know, you know, cooperate and, and, and compete with each other in one space, but collaborate in the other. Mm -hmm. So you'll find non-traditional partnerships forming and value being created out of that. <clears throat> now, let me illustrate that with an example that, that we all know. If you really think about it, what is Amazon.com? Is that that they are, they are the largest, world's largest online retailer? Yeah, they are, no doubt, but they just went into consumer electronics by manufacturing Kindle, right? And, and Kindle Fire tablet computers. So are they an electronics company? Or given that they're into cloud services, are they now cloud computing services? Guess what? They are also into entertainment because they just have exclusive streaming rights to some of the really cool shows. At least I think they are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or from Black is awesome. Um, right? So are they a media company? Or are they now going to compete with their partners by, do, by delivering Amazon delivery services? Right? If you stop and think about it, this is just one in solid example that we all know of that we can relate to. Netflix is another, right? They started out as a logistics company, if you will. The biggest challenge was logistics. How do I get this video from point A to point B in the shortest amount of time, reliably, and back? 50 million customers and God knows how many million movies later, they figured out with data that who their customers are, what they're watching when, what do they binge watch when, what do they not watch when, and based on that, now they're getting into producing TV shows, mm -hmm. House of Cards, right? So from being a logistics company, they're now an entertainment company. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? 
based on data that they had, they began experimenting with it, they began to realize value out of it, new business models emerged, started creating partnerships, and voila, they're into now you know, a new business. That's what agile companies do, that's what millennial enterprises do, and that's what we see as some of the characteristics of millennial enterprises, Great. right? We talked about customer centricity, agility, experimentation, you can go on and on, but the point is all these are achievable or achieved through the big data and the information and insights they, they gather from that. Now if you really think about it, that's fine, but do, do really customers you know, really understand this? Or sorry, do enterprises really understand this? 80% of the CEOs believe that they develop superior customer experience. But guess what? Only 8% of their customers <laughs> agree, okay? Why is there this disconnect? Yeah. That is simply because they don't understand the new customer. I'm putting this up to make a, make a point, right? Meaning the face of the new customer is changing. Right? You know, there was once, you know, a few years ago, you know, I listened to a speech from, I think, um, um, a marketing development exec from Nike, and they were not doing that well. It's because the kids didn't want to wear what their parents were wearing. So they went with Skechers, or, or whatever the new brand was at that time. So the simple reason that the Nike didn't really realize that, hey, it's all a question of perception. My market has changed. The consumer is now the younger next generation, and one of their sentiments is that, I don't want to wear what my dad's wearing, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't look cool. So the point is, what does these little, you know, new generation of new millennial customers, you know, what are they looking for, right? Got to understand them, and it is, Angela, again to the point you made around customer segmentation, I don't want to be known as or grouped into a group of 100,000 or a group of 10,000 or even a group of 1,000. I want to be known as an individual and treat me as an individual. At the same time, surprise me as well. Right? How do you do that? Mm. Right? that? That's a key challenge. And if you do that, there is value to be had at the end. So, Johan, you touched on this, this influences and... and, and, and mining of some, some social media information. <clears throat> I know you guys can read the information behind me while I'm talking, so I'm not gonna talk about that. You know, it, it triggered a thought in me. We did, a, we did an interesting experiment for a client of ours. We took 100 million tweets over a period of time. And this is, this is real stuff that we did. 100 million tweets, and we, we analyzed them and found out that there were 17 and a half million unique IDs, meaning average of what, five and a half to six tweets per ID, right? So we took the 17 and a half million unique profiles, mapped them to the customers of this client that we had, and f found out how many of them were account holders, right? We have some technology that, that does that. And that turned out to be three and a half million. 100 million tweets, 17 and a half million unique IDs, three and a half million of them are customers, we did a psycholinguistic profile of the tweets that they had, 100 million tweets, and figured out that 200,000 of them were interested in travel, 300,000 of them were students. Mm. And what this customer said was, I want to find out students who are interested in travel. So the intersection of these two yielded 8,000 unique IDs of customers who are students who are interested in travel. Then we did influencer analysis on them and found out 71 specific influencers. Mm -hmm. So if we market appropriately to these 71 influencers, they will have an impact on the 8,000 we want to address. Mm -hmm. So 100 million, 17 and a half million, three and a half million, 200,000 and 300,000, an intersection of 8,000, identify 71 influencers, and I know everything about every single one of them. 71 is easy for, for a customer service rep to look through and, and provide the one-on-one -on -one service. So the point is, this took about three and a half hours and $2,000 to execute from a cost basis. Mm. So the point is simply this, you can take massive amounts of data, make it more and more relevant, and have us treat the customers as individuals. So now I know a lot about those 71 from this mass of 100 million tweets, right? That's what the value of this is. So how do you take this gazillion bits of data and then make sense out of that? 
and, and you know, create influences, if you will, that really have an impact. Now, switching gears, you know, I'm fascinated by, by, by big data, and I talked about big data as a business, and, and one area where we see significant emergence is in the genomics. Where, and, and it has an impact on healthcare and such. But the point is, this is an area where the costs of folding genomes have dropped 10,000 times in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. from about $100,000 to under $1,000 for protein folding. And so you may say, so what? The so what is that what you see on the right-hand side, the downstream analysis opportunities are significant. Now that you can do the analysis for under $1,000, there's so much you can do based on understanding what has been analyzed. So what we, what we saw as a $2.8 billion <coughs> market in 2010 in a matter of a decade is now about 15 times that. Right? There's economic value for you new businesses popping up, right? So the key points, big data by itself is great, but you've got to do your analytics on it and gain some insights out of that to, to, to get some value. The last point I'll make is this. So how do you generate this, right? Word, this doesn't come automatically, right? Just by having big data, it doesn't yield that. The system that, that Johan was talking about, I'd call that as a system of insight. So system of record is the information that enterprises have within their four walls or their partners. System of <clears throat> engagement is this vast amount of social, unstructured, external data that you have that you could connect with. But connecting with is not easy. But if you're able to, and if you're able to gain insights from that, then there is value to be gained. And these are not done automatically, we need to create a class of systems, or a class of systems are emerging, let me put it that way, like Johan was talking about, which are systems of insight that let you take meaningful, or let, let you take systems of record and connect it with systems of engagement and make meaningful relationships emerge from those, gain insights from that, and have value. So I'll close with, with the point I made earlier, data plus analysis is information. Information in the right context gives you insight. And insight with action, you have to take the right action. Just by having insight alone doesn't cut it because we'll be swimming in the sea of insights and you'll say, wow, there's insight all around me. Which one do I do? What do I take, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have right action on that. Mm -hmm. That will yield outcomes that will realize value. I think I'm spot on with 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. I will say that one of the things I've noticed is the kids not only don't want to wear the clothes of their parents, they also don't want to use the social media oh, of their of parents. <laughs> yes. Um, and it's hard to follow them because they move so quickly. But uh, I know that my 14-year-old now is no longer Facebook is absolutely out, mm -hmm. um, will not use Facebook. Uh, I don't know what they, you know, they move very quickly onto the next very fast uh, social media. Uh, but I do wish you'd ask Facebook to stop offering me clothes for my grandchildren. <laughs> I don't have grandchildren, okay? So I just want that, like, could somebody send that out to the internet? Okay, I don't have grandchildren. All right, let's have some um, questions uh, from the audience for this fantastic panel. I, I do want to make one point about the fact that you don't have grandchildren and they're still <laughs> marketing to you. On the flip side, you know, there was this new item you may have seen where Target ended up mailing a um, set of pregnancy oh, related. Oh yeah, somebody right? mentioned this yesterday. Yeah. Uh, to 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 a teenage daughter, and and it's interesting that the mom did not know uh, of the daughter's situation. So there's uh -huh. privacy concerns on the other end, and then you know incorrect marketing on the other side. <laughs> You've got to walk the line in between. <laughs> right. Exactly. Good morning, John. Good morning. Um, yeah, what I'm hearing a little bit here is big data uh, equals big bucks. And what you're saying in a particular user uh, is for the big corporation that wants to get bigger. But I'm a mama papa operation right. out on the street with a little pizza parlor or something <coughs> like that. Uh, this is a new world for me. So where am I going to go in order to uh, get my uh, questions answered out of big data? 
And more importantly, what's, what's it going to cost people? Mm -hmm. I interesting point. You know, um, you, you can borrow this. It just, I happened to look through this a, a while ago. This is Wall Street Journal on January 9th, 2014. It's about entrepreneurs shaping free data into money. It was a, a point around how commonly available information are being taken advantage by mom and pop uh, you know, shop owners or, or, or enterprises, as well as you know, um, new companies or, or new initiatives that are emerging. This was more around you know, I, I don't remember all of this. I just happened to see this in the folder I had. But I do recall that it, this was a, an example was called out in, in Seattle where an individual, um, I think Matt Ulrich, Ulrichman, created a small business uh, for, uh, based on contracts that the city of Seattle was, was letting out. In other words, he connected the city permits to the building contractors to the performance that they were doing and the kind of work that they were doing, connected all this information, made it available for something like an Angie's List for you and I, where you could go look at it and say which um, construction company is doing what kind of work and how are they rated and are they doing well um, in, in, a, in a given neighborhood. So my, my point in, in bringing this up to answer your question is, big data is not just, big data hopefully is big bucks, but you know it doesn't always mean huge amount of work either. Mm -hmm. There are ways that we can be creative in, and innovative in capitalizing on what is available around us um, to, to take advantage of <coughs> available information around us, connecting it to deliver value to the neighborhood, to deliver value to citizens. I do a lot of work in smarter cities, and, and uh, Johan, I think you touched on this, I don't remember the exact point, but the sentiment of the citizens. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at what do I, want to know as, as a resident of, of Columbus, Ohio, um, actually I live in Black Lake, but still in Franklin County, you know, if I, if I do that, what, what do I want to find out, right? When we had the power outage uh, due to, due to the thunderstorms you know, last year, in, when Gahanna was the epicenter of that, it was so pathetic that I could not find information about what was going on just yeah, around yeah, myself, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking this is not big data, this is data. Give me information that I want. So there's a lot to be done. I know, you know, um, I, in, in a, you know, it's long-winded answer to your point, but this is a key point in that big data doesn't mean just big enterprises. Big data means, that, you know, it's also very, very meaningful to the individual as a citizen and as small enterprises and, and mom and shop stores. And we just need to find the right ways to go make it happen. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that that I'm a, I'm a big fan of do it yourself. Yeah. And uh, the, the nice thing about, I mean, we talk about big data again, it's that Dilbert cartoon. You know, it's not like an ominous cloud that, that <coughs> some ghostly entity that rules us all. I mean, the, the, if you're a mom and pop shop, uh, uh, shop, the only thing you can do is with a, with a, with a two-line Python script, you can essentially you know, tap into the Twitter feed, look up what your customers are saying about you, mm. rate yeah. what they, very often the sentence scores come along with it, it's just that it's a commodity. Rate what they've been saying about your, your pizzas or whatever it is. It's really, I mean, I've got a student literally that has a blog that shows you in like 10 lines of, of code how you can monitor the, 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 the sentiment of the world, mm -hmm. right? A anyone with a computer, that's the big democratization that's happening here. And I think that that aspect is sometimes lost in our discussions of big data, what it means for big enterprise. It's, it's a situation where just about anyone who's got a computer science 101 mm -hmm. education, right, and can, can write a, a sort of a computer script, can tap into this kind of data, which is made available for free, and can, can glean very valuable insights that make into their, their, their daily lives <coughs> on that data. So what I will say though is that edu from the educational perspective, and I stress that I've got a 10 year old, you know, I, 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 I'm making absolutely sure that she knows how to code. Mm. And I think that's, beca that's become one of the biggest gaps, mm. knowing how to code, knowing how to work the computer, knowing how to work those data, knowing how to work the API, knowing how to tap into those streams. The, the basic principles are very simple, but you have to know them. And once you know them, it's just like a car. Once you know how a car works, you, you, could, you, could, you, know, you could change the oil yourself, right? And why wouldn't you? Let's yeah. welcome Betsy. Well, uh, good morning. One thing. I think I'm a oh, simple person. And, and I think, again, uh, I'm Excel. It's about all I can handle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll tell you that a lot of the thinking at the company, it's also at Microsoft, yeah. is that we're not going to build, you know, 
a lot of these new complicated tools, because if you talk to me about Hadoop and all these buzzwords of the world, I personally, as a business person, I don't know how to do it. If you give me something in that spreadsheet in Excel, which I think it's probably most mom and pop um, shops will be able to handle spreadsheets, um, you know, it is gonna be it. And so I think simple frontline tools are important. Mm -hmm. um, and at least, you know, a lot of thinking probably amongst a lot of big companies, well, how do you get all that goodness, the data, the cloud stuff and all that in the back end, but again, just deliver everything through, hey, a simple spreadsheet. You can, you know, run all your analyses just, just from there along. Right. So. Or, or simply go to Twitter, they've got a search box at the top, and type in mom yeah. and pop. Yep. There you go. That's all right. really all it takes. Let's get a new question. I've got a boring question for Johan. I'm interested in your sample, your Twitter sample. So do you generate like a stratified random sample to uh, run your analysis on? Or I, I hear a lot of uh, um, analyses on Twitter, and I'm, I'm curious about the sampling methodology. Yeah, yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a, that's a very good question. Something we're concerned with a lot. I mean, it depends on the application. I, people want, uh, you know, in, in, in computational social science, you want the sample to be representative, yeah. right, for the problem that you're uh, investigating. In our case, since we're selling these signals to hedge funds, we might be interested in very different communities that are not representative of the U.S. population right. or the world's population as a whole. Right? Whether we can achieve that kind of sample is, is of course, a different question. We think we can. We think we can actually define the sample as, as a function of the, the, the intended outcome mm. of the signal in terms of its predictive value. Mm. Right? If, you know, the, 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 the analysis that I've shown you is based on sort of the raw Twitter feed without any adjustment <coughs> for, okay. for sampling, et cetera. But we, and, and even then, it has, uh, in our experience, has pretty good predictive value. Once you start to slice and dice that data, and you actually zoom in on sort of what we call, well, let me put it this way, in terms of the markets, information that ev that's available to everyone is not very useful because it gets factored into the market m nearly immediately. So what we're looking for is sort of privileged information, communities that, that have information that isn't widespread and still valuable and predicted. And so we've got algorithms that specifically adjust the sample to, to match that incentive, and I think that's what most companies in the, this area are doing. Mm -hmm. Now again, if, 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 you want a sort of, if you're doing a, a opinion polling and you're using Twitter, you have to be very, very careful that you have a sample that's representative of the U.S. population, you're gonna get it totally wrong. Mm. And mo most people that in, in this industry are aware of those biases, they're aware of the need to, to, to at least make an effort to create a representative sample. How well they succeed in doing so is not always clear. And to give you another example, uh, recently we, I worked with a team of sociologists at Indiana University, and we looked at whether we could predict the outcomes of... Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. like, is this better? No, you're fine. Yeah. Okay. So we were looking at whether we could predict the outcome of uh, uh, congressional elections by looking at uh, about 450, 480 U.S. congressional districts and looking at the name mentions of the candidates. Mm. And that in and of itself was, was, was enough to achieve a 92, 93 percent accuracy in predicting wow. who's going to win the election, wow. adjusting for incumbency, you know, whether Amazing. Obama or McCain, you know, uh, dominated the district, et cetera. So even if you don't adjust for the sample, a lot of people don't understand this, but you've got 500 million people on Twitter right now, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's the population of the European Union, grosso modo. That's more than there are people in the United States. So in terms of sample, I, I to totally agree. It's, 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 there's a whole science to making sure that the sample matches the intended outcome. But even when you do not adjust for the sample, like we foolishly did early on, and like we did with the, the study to predict the uh, outcome of these elections, even then it works pretty well because such a broad swath of the population is represented on Twitter and Facebook right now. So do you do I, it by time? I mean, I have a little company and we just um, generate uh, stratified random samples and we distribute them to students and we do it based on time and tweet, yeah. um, you know, quantity. And, um, and so, and we, you know, we do it randomly. And I was just curious, you know, I hear a lot of um, uh, analyses based on this and then, you know, if you dig a little deeper, it's on, you know, news feed tweets mm -hmm. or, yeah. you know, and yeah. that's what I, I guess I'm, I was really curious if you had some sort of, you know, target population that you were um, sampling from or if it was truly. Well, and he has papers to post Yes, it, exactly. So. Yeah, well, yeah. we do, we do, but when it comes to the actual startup, yeah, I mean, the, the answer is yes, but uh, but I'm not going to tell you what those communities <laughs> are yeah. and they change. Okay, right. They that's, I guess so I'm It's just a dynamic <laughs> process where we're continuously updating who we're tracking and right. why. But I will tell you, it's not as straightforward as just tapping into the, uh, the AP right. feed and then discovering <laughs> that two bombs went off at the White House, and then we all freak out and the market crashes. Yeah. So it's not, yeah. <laughs> that, that's not what we do. Oh, cool. Right, thank you. <laughs> thanks, Betsy. All right. Good morning. Good morning. It, Good morning. Thanks again to the fantastic panel. It, it, it used to be when I knew something about it 
that a CEO decision on whether or not to adopt a new technology to trade in an old legacy system for distributed computing or something like that would require the IT people to say, we're going to get a return on investment in six months. I was wondering, based on what you all are saying, I was wondering if there's now an emerging Moore's Law or something like that having to do with the timelines on return of investment. Mm -hmm. it sounds like we can do it almost right away. I hope we can do it right away. And I'm glad, <laughs> well, and, and trust me, CEOs are asking for what's my ROI uh, in, in terms of days and weeks. But the reality is, you're right, <clears throat> we are seeing a shrinkage in the expectation of the business, uh, I say business because in some cases it is CEOs, CMOs, line of business executives who are really making this call on what is the ROI on this, but they also want to have that, that, that no longer is six months uh, or a year a, a, an acceptable time frame, it's time measured in weeks and, and maybe months. And, and the, on the flip side, it is very interesting that you can now show some of that ROI as well because we have to adopt agile, iterative approaches. And I think Facebook is, and I, I can't quite remember exactly when this occurred, but they experimented so f often in a matter of days was their cycle as to where they would put a button, of, uh, you know, a like mm. button, for yeah. example. The point there is the opportunity exists for you to try out, figure out whether this will fly or not, mm -hmm. what the impact of that is, make appropriate course corrections, and move on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I didn't get into this much, but when we look at the millennial enterprise, as we look out and say, how are enterprises going to deal with this, what is the expectation of them in the coming years, the point you made is one of the key ones in that shrinking expectation, you know, almost immediate gratification on activities and the ability to experiment rapidly and able to learn from it and make course corrections is the way to go. We don't set, you know, plans that are for 18 months and don't change. You have to set a goal, no doubt, but you have to build a roadmap that is iterative and often zigzags along the way. So you may end up slightly different from where you originally targeted but you will be in the same quadrant, you won't be way off. Mm -hmm. Angela, did you have a comment on that? Well, I, I think one more thing I'll add is that I think um, with, uh, so, so that's, you know, there's one part about analyzing the big data that's in your company, but then there's a ton of data that lives outside, outside and there's so many more cloud-based services now that allows you to kind of tap into that pretty immediately. So again, I think mm -hmm. to your point of shrinking timelines, I think it's gonna be faster to try something out and see whether you get a return on it or not, and you can do a go, no go yep. without you know a huge amount of investment. I mean, in politics, I mean, I don't want to dominate the, the panel discussion, but I, I've seen examples where, for example, when the president gives a State of the Union, people tap into the Twitter feed, uh, yep. perform sentiment analysis, and you essentially have sort of a real-time line indicating how the population of mm -hmm. the United States is responding to Obama using the word responsibility 50 times or, you know, the, it, you, you can immediately pick up and, you know, my colleagues and I have been joking that would be a great tool to, to, to put like a little buzzer on, on the presidential candidates <laughs> and as soon as the Twitter feed <laughs> dives, you know, they get a little shocked because they don't say that again. <laughs> so a little bit, when Romney said this whole thing about wanting binders with women, you know, perhaps you should have gotten like a little shock and said, oh no, I'm not going to say that again, but, but, but that, that's sort of the, the, the level of real time that, we, that we've gotten to. In one of our other projects, we're actually using common sense uh, knowledge databases, again, that we've taken f online, which are freely available, have them parsed into a computer in a knowledge network, and then when someone says something, it can be decomposed into predicate statements, into actual statements that can be matched against a common sense knowledge base, and where the computer makes an estimation of how truthy that is. Mm -hmm. Where you can actually look at it and say, well, yeah, it's kind of, that's probably not entirely true, but and to do so in real time. Well, so that's the, the, scary. <laughs> Good morning, Nate. How are you? Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, so following on uh, Johan's idea of uh, the democratization of uh, technology, uh, one thing that I'm very curious about is, is you know, what, you know, that there may be uh, long-term positive implications for mom and pop shops. You know, so it is not expensive in this day and age for me to get a positive Yelp review for a slice of pizza. Uh, it's not expensive for me to uh, develop, uh, you know, to, to host a web page or even to develop a web page uh, because it doesn't necessarily require a lot of coding savvy. Uh, but on the other side, in terms of uh, technology services, if I wanted to spin up an, uh, an elastic cloud computing uh, instance on uh, AWS, 
and I want to do my sophisticated analytics as just you know s sitting here right now. Uh, you know, I can get, you know, I can build my own cluster for a couple of dollars an hour. Right. Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, across industries, I'm very curious in terms of economic impacts of uh, what you see the short and long-term implications are uh, in terms of size of companies, you know, and, and when there are winners and losers, you know, how much of it is going to be uh, two-person outfits, you know, I have, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, CTO and, uh, you know, uh, COO, and, you know, that's, that's us, <laughs> uh, versus, um, you know, IBM or Microsoft or uh, Amazon, who can obviously you know, leverage, you know, like, and continue to pivot and have like the, this big diversity and, and platform to keep building on. Yeah, I, 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 the only thing I, I, I totally agree. I think this is, this is exactly what's happening. I mean, it's, I see this among my students. You've got two students. One of them declares himself to be the CEO. The other declares herself to be the CTO. They uh, they set up a cluster on uh, AWS and they're up and running. It's absolutely amazing. If you got, I mean, the democratization is. I mean, people underestimate how democratic these, these these systems have become, how easily accessible they are. If you have the knowledge to 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 to, to use them and exploit them and to gain insights from them, so I, I couldn't agree more. I think that is absolutely what's happening. I don't know what the implications for larger businesses are. Uh, you know, I don't know what the implications for, for example, Microsoft and IBM are, but but some of these have are very agile, and I think that they're, they're picking up on those kind of uh, trends very quickly themselves. But my, my gut feeling is, yes, that that's exactly what's happening. If you look at the, the level of entrepreneurship among our students, it's absolutely amazing. Some of them, you know, waft in and out of academia to mm -hmm. startups, mm -hmm. back from the startups to academia, mm -hmm. and it is because it's so, it's, it's the, 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 the cost of entry, the threshold of actually can, engaging in those activities is very, very low, and the systems are accessible to just about anyone with a laptop and a Wi-Fi mm -hmm. connection. I see that. Also, I teach nonprofit uh, leadership, and I, st I just start the <coughs> class by asking how many of you already have your own nonprofit, and a number of the students <laughs> raise their hand. They have their own nonprofits already, doing really amazingly creative things with it. Right. So, In innovation has been the backbone of, of you know, advancements, and then particularly if you look at the, the U.S., uh, you know, we have had a long history of innovation fueled innovation-driven um, you know, enterprises coming up, and, or at least being a big factor of that. Um, and I see that, that this um, democratization of these capabilities or, or, or normalization, of these, uh, normalization of the availability of these technologies right, makes innovation much more feasible, much mm -hmm. more uh, possible. That, that's on the, on the one side. The other side, what I see occurring is that this is also becoming a much more global phenomenon, mm. right? <clears throat> so it also opens up the threat, if you will, if you say innovation is on the decline in the U.S. And, you know, there are statistics to support anything that you mm -hmm. want to say, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not here to debate whether innovation is on the decline in the U.S. or not, but the point is, you know, global innovation is on the increase or it's on the rise. So there's positives to it and negatives to it. How do you take advantage of that? Right? So I, I think this, this opportunity is just prime for, for new innovative ideas to emerge. And I'm an optimist, and, and I take that as a positive thing and say, wow, there's so much happening that new things can be <laughs> right? And from a large enterprise standpoint, um, we, we have to be more and more agile. That, that's what we see, we see as, as, you know, both culturally, as well as organizationally, as well as how we you know, are able to make business decisions, interact with partners. So the whole composition of how the enterprises are structured and, and the perception and how they manage within themselves, they're all going to be you know, going through a transformation. Yeah, I'm an optimist and, and probably skewed by being in the, the, my perception by being in the tech sector. Um, I mean, in a way, I think small companies, startups have an advantage of, it's kind of like the classic innovator's dilemma, right? You know, yeah. you, you, you have the plain open field and you've got um, much lower cost of entry now to innovate and in the, it being in the tech and social sector, you think of Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, um, Instagram, whatnot, all these little companies that, hey, like five years ago were nobodies and um, and now, you know, lots of big companies are threatened by them and spends billions and billions of dollars trying to snap them up. Um, so, so I'm very optimistic for smaller companies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, guys. All right, Peter. So picking up a bit on what Ray said about globalization and Johanna said about the democratization of 
these possibilities. I guess my question is actually for Angela, reaching back to your work on developing countries, which is I wonder, I'm wondering how much of the capacity of developing countries to take advantage of the economic value that data could create depends on also you know, broadband policies, you That's know, right. uh, infrastructure. infrastructural yeah. policies that mm -hmm. go beyond data and whether you have a sense whether, you know, c countries are aware of that and moving in the right direction. Yeah, um, I, 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 would, I would say so. I mean, first I echo the point that I think infrastructure um, is uh, from everything from the very basic, you know, in some emerging market you're talking about basic like electricity and, and whatnot, right, mm -hmm. to the more broadband <laughs> infrastructure. I think that's going to be a... Um, interesting factor for emerging uh, emerging economies um, in terms of how fast they will realize the impact of big data because I think we would all agree that the potential is there um, uh, in terms of how fast that needles moving um, I mean I would hope that there are plenty of examples out there that should show governments you know what they should do you take South Korea for an example um, you know they have much much higher broadband penetration than us and they've had you know, much more success, that they have lots of successful um, tech companies, um, services and software and otherwise that have come out of there, um, you know, Japan, whatnot. Um, so I think that, you know, the other emerging economies are kind of like India, China, sort of like right, right after, um, in terms of their degree of infrastructure maturity, um, um, is certainly aware of that. Um, and I think, again, to, to Ray's point, we are starting to see um, uh, innovation on the global scale, not just coming from the Western market, but coming from the India and Chinas of the world. Again, in the social world we live in, we think a lot about, you know, China is very different, right? Like Facebook and Twitter, you know, doesn't make a dent there. You know, it's about their local homegrown guys like Tencent and, um, and e-commerce like Alibaba, Taobao, and, and all of them have global ambition. And so we're definitely seeing a wave of innovations happening there that is now, you know, globalizing, so rather than the kind of west to east, but east to west as well. Awesome. May I make one point, though? Infrastructure is, is, is certainly important. At the same time, what we're finding, particularly in Africa, is that lack of infrastructure forces you to be creative in different ways. Mm -hmm. Right. So while, while it is certainly an, a, an accelerator for innovation, don't get me wrong, there are also way, creative ways that emerge. You know, the, the unbanked, I don't have the statistics, you know, at the top of my head, but there's a significant amount of unbanked population in, uh, in Africa, so particularly mm -hmm. sub-Saharan Africa. However, they have more cell phones there than they have bank accounts. Mm -hmm. So how can you make, you know, banking through your cell phone possible? So no money exchanges hands, but uh, all these transactions occur between merchants and individuals uh, uh, you know, through the cell phone. That is something so creative that they have mastered, if you will. But uh, I'm just quoting that as an example of how you, know, you get more creative um, uh, you know, in that space. Okay, I asked if we could please have a few minutes going over, so we did go over just a tiny bit into coffee break, but um, I know that you appreciated this fabulous panel, and so would you join me in thanking them? All right, <clears throat> coffee break until 10.30. <laughs>